Good evening. Welcome to Medicine in Our Backyard. It's great to have you with us tonight. This is a series that's presented by the Newport Beach Public Library Foundation in partnership with UC Irvine Health. My name is Adrian Windsor. I'm a member of the board of the foundation. And we always begin by thanking our very generous sponsors, Mike and Polly Smith, who've been supporting this program ever since it was founded. They are our founding sponsors, and we are going to be honoring them at a summer solstice on June 14th. How many of you are members? Great, okay, well, the Library Foundation is a membership foundation, and our mission is to support the library, to fund valuable resources, uh, to provide programs, the Witty series, the library live series, as well as financial, uh, book discussion groups. So we urge you, if you're not a member, to become a member. And the summer solstice is a celebration of our new members. So you have until May 27th, that's until Friday, to become a member, and you will be invited to the summer solstice. We're going to have wine hors d'oeuvres and a wonderful speaker, Susan Strait, who has the best-selling novel, Mecca. She'll be our speaker that night. So I urge you to become a member if you aren't. Now I want to introduce a couple of people that you may not be aware of, except one of them greets you every time you walk in this door, that is Kanga. Wagmo Upshaw. Conga, will you stand up? Oh. <laughs> Conga is scheduled for a new baby on the very day of the summer solstice, and so she's going to begin her maternity leave at the end of this week. But she's done such a marvelous job, along with Jane Merritt, in providing us with the programming for this series. And as we end the season, I want to thank them. I also want you to honor our CEO, Jerry Kappel. He's, he's been a wonderful addition to our foundation and has been so helpful in promoting our programs and leading the capital drive for the new, uh, lecture hall, we're call, at, actually it's going to be a civic auditorium, it's, and it's going to be a wonderful addition to our whole community. So thank you, Jerry, for being here. All right, so this session will conclude with Q&A. I urge you to save your questions until the very end. If you haven't silenced your phone, I would like to ask you to do it right now. <laughs> One of our speakers is silencing her phone. <laughs> All right, so now I, I'd like to introduce, we have two speakers tonight who are going to tell us how to keep our healthy skin healthy during the summer uh, as we move into the season of being out in the bright sun. Our first is going to be Dr. Smith. Correct? Dr. Shu. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I got it twisted around here. Okay, Dr. Shu, here's our first speaker, Dr. Jessica Shu. She's a board certified UCI health dermatologist who specializes in vitil vitiligo, vitiligo, inflammatory skin disorders, skin cancers, and melanocytic neoplasms. Dr. Shu earned her medical degree and PhD at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, medical scientist training program in Baltimore. She completed an internal medicine internship at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, followed by a residency in dermatology at the UCI School of Medicine. Her research interests include tissue homeostasis mechanisms and melanocytic related skin disorders. Oh my gosh, I hope none of us have any of that. <laughs> Her research interests include, I just read that. Um, so then our second speaker is going to be Dr. Janellen Smith. And she obtained her medical degree from the University of Iowa 
completed her internship at St. John Mercy Medical Center and her residency at the University of Michigan <coughs> Hospitals. That happens to be my university, so that makes me very happy. Dr. Smith is a professor at the Department of Dermatology at the UCI School of Medicine and co-directed a pigmented lesion program. So let me first introduce Dr. Shu, who's going to come and speak to us and uh, let us enjoy our evening. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm Jessica Shu. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction. I'm sorry. We have a lot of long, fancy words in dermatology, but we're going to try, Dr. Smith and I are going to try and explain things so it should be easily understood, and we'll have a question session at the end. Uh, so today we're going to talk about uh, skin cancer, some signs, uh, and how to prevent it. Uh, we don't have any disclosures. Uh, and so I just provided a basic outline of what we're going to go through today. Uh, I'm just going to start with a basic introduction to skin in terms of what it does and, you know, why we see skin cancers over time uh, and talk about why our skin ages. And then the first part will be uh, on some common skin growths that are benign. Uh, and then I'll talk about some common skin cancers like basal cell skin cancer and squamous cell skin cancer. Uh, and then Dr. Smith, uh, who is our melanoma expert at UCI, will talk about uh, melanoma, uh, which is the deadliest skin cancer. So you know we devoted more time to that. And then also cover some basic prevention strategies. Um, and so, you know, uh, something we don't think about a lot is that the skin is actually the largest organ in our body, and it carries a lot of important functions. It uh, forms a barrier to protect things from entering uh, and from infections in general. So, you know, if you can imagine, our skin actually sees a lot of different things, right? Dust, dirt, things flowing around in the air, but we don't usually get sick. Uh, and that's because our skin is a very good barrier against a lot of these environmental exposures. It helps to regulate our body temperature, so we don't think about this a lot in terms of skin function. But you know, in the summer when we sweat, you know, that is your primary sign of your skin regulating your body temperature. You know, when it's overheating, that's one of the ways it cools us down. Uh, and then it also is very important in terms, in terms of enabling us to feel the sensation of touch. Uh, and so there is now a lot of research uh, related to how the functions behind touch can also be related to functions in inflammation and different skin disorders. Uh, and so just very broadly speaking, our skin is divided into three main compartments. Uh, and so at the very top here, this pointer, right? Uh, this is the epidermis on the very top layer of our skin. Uh, and that is the layer that provides the crucial barrier function. Uh, and then in the dermis, which is the deeper layer uh, of our skin, are a lot of the blood vessels, our hair follicles, and sweat glands. Uh, and then finally, we have the subcutaneous tissue, which is fat generally, uh, and then a muscle layer. And that's the structure of our skin. And the reason why uh, it's important is just in terms of thinking about how skin cancer can grow and spread. You know, the, uh, it's important to have a very basic understanding of just how the skin is structured. And so uh, the epidermis, the top layer of the skin here, uh, as I mentioned, is the key uh, function is the key layer that prevents germs from entering. And it's actually very important in terms of renewing. Uh, the reason why we shed, you know, you can kind of get dead skin every day is that our skin is constantly dividing and providing new signals to our body uh, depending on what is present. Uh, and it also provides our skin color. You know, uh, we, we don't think about this, but when you tan, you know, the, it's actually melanin. There's pigment being produced in this layer of skin that we're seeing. And then uh, the second layer is the dermis, uh, which makes up of 90% of our skin thickness. Uh, and it contains a lot of collagen and elastin, and it can grow hair and sweat and is responsible for oil production. And this is the layer that mainly kind of shrinks and thins as we get older, which uh, I'll go into a little bit more as well. 
Uh, and so we don't think about this, but we actually have a lot of skin. Uh, just one inch of skin contains 19 million skin cells, which is a lot. Uh, and 60,000 of those are from uh, the cell type called melanocytes, which produces pigment. Uh, and then what happens is that the, after the pigment is produced, it's then spread and transferred to all the other skin cells that are in your skin. And so if you think about it, it's actually very amazing that our skin is so evenly colored in general. Uh, it also contains just one inch of skin, contains uh, a thousand nerve, nerve endings and uh, 20 blood vessels. So, you know, kind of going back to that the skin is very important in terms of how you feel things and how sensation comes about. Uh, and so, uh, for an average adult, there's around 20 square feet of skin, and that's six pounds. It's estimated to weigh six pounds. Uh, so that's a, that's a lot. <laughs> Uh, and so, you know, when we think about skin and aging and skin cancer, you know, one of the things in terms of why our skin ages is over time, you know, less and less collagen is produced. And that dermis layer, which I had mentioned is the thickest layer, uh, what happens is that after our 20s, you know, collagen production is going down. And as, as it goes down, it thins. Uh, the cushion is just kind of shrinking. And our capacity to renew that layer also decreases with aging. And so there is an overall loss in collagen. There's also a loss in fat and bone. And so um, as we age, you, you can imagine that the dermis layer here just kind of gets thinner. And then there are also extrinsic factors that can contribute to our skin aging. You know, one of the main things that we see in dermatology clinic is probably related to sun exposure. Uh, what sun exposure does is that it damages the skin and also thins that layer uh, of collagen that we see uh, further, you know, other than the decreased renewal capacity. Uh, things like sun exposure, smoking, and other environmental exposures can further thin and damage the skin. And so by the time our 40s comes around, uh, our skin is already much thinner and less barrier and lipids are produced. Uh, and so signs of aging become more prominent, uh, usually at this stage. And so what that means is that over time, you know, when we hit our 50s and 60s, uh, you then see a lot of the skin signs of aging that we commonly see. Uh, such as wrinkling and thinning. Uh, you see easy bruising because that collagen cushion is gone. Uh, and then you also see sunspots and uh, our skin also produces less lipids as we get older. So you, a lot of people feel like their skin gets drier as they get older as well. And so, you know, uh, this is just a very, actually a quite famous picture that illustrates the damage that sun exposure can do to your skin. Uh, so this is a published picture of a truck driver for over 30 years. Uh, uh, and so even though you have windows up, the windows don't actually protect from all types of UV rays from the sun. Uh, and so you can appreciate on the left side of his face, you know, that he sees a lot more sun exposure. There is a significant amount of, uh, more significant amounts of aging and wrinkling that you can visibly see. And I think that's just such a good example uh, in the same person to illustrate what, you know, sun exposure alone can do to our skin. And so I think a lot of you are probably familiar with the term sunspots. Uh, and we know that sun exposure, for example, can lead to benign skin growths, you know, such as uh, liver spots or sunspots that are commonly seen on the hand uh, or, or on the face and shoulders. Uh, and they're usually on these uh, areas that are exposed to the sun. And they're benign, you know, but sometimes can look worrisome. And so, you know, that's always uh, one of the reasons why we see some of our patients in our dermatology clinic on a day to day basis. And so this leads me to some of the other benign skin growths that we commonly see that sometimes people are worried about. And so I think it's important to cover some of the benign ones before we enter the skin cancer uh, category. 
And so the first uh, one that we commonly see is something called seborrheic keratosis. Uh, we kind of refer to them as barnacles just because they don't look the most attractive. Uh, and some of them can be scaly, uh, but actually some of them can also be flat. And they can appear anywhere on the body. Uh, they increase with age and sometimes can look a little worrisome in terms of the unevenness of the color and the fact that it can be itchy but generally they're considered benign. Another common benign skin growth that we see is a blood vessel growth called cherry angiomas. Uh, and so these are actually blood vessel growths uh, that are present as little red dots. They're also benign uh, and can grow over time. Uh, they tend to bleed a little bit, uh, and so that can be very inconvenient for a lot of our patients when they are in sensitive areas, uh, but they're also considered benign growths. And then uh, skin tags are another category of benign skin growths that we commonly see. Uh, they're usually around sites of friction, so around your collar, uh, under the armpit, or the breast, uh, where there's a lot of friction with clothes or your skin itself. Uh, and that's another benign skin growth that we commonly see. And then we enter this category of moles. You know, I think a lot of us have moles. They're very common, uh, but they can be a little trickier, you know, uh, mainly because first of all, they can have many different appearances. So some of them can look on the pink side um, and some of them are more tan and some are dark brown uh, that you can see in this picture. And mostly they are benign, you know, we grow up with moles uh, and they tend to develop more as we get a little older. Uh, but they, these are the ones that potentially sometimes can turn into a melanoma that Dr. Smith will highlight a little more in terms of what, out to, watch to, look, what to look out for. Uh, and then um, this is when we transition into some of the worrisome skin growth we then see that are usually in the skin cancer category. Uh, so I will just talk about basal cell uh, and squamous cell skin cancer. So when should you worry? You know, I think that's one of the questions we get a lot. Uh, what are usually signs of skin cancer? Uh, usually they're rough. They, they can present as rough and scaly red patches that usually crust and bleed, but they never go away. Uh, so, you know, just the fact that some of my patients can tell me, oh, they go away and then they come back, usually that's not a sign of a true skin cancer. It can mean that they could be pre they're precancerous lesions, but for true skin cancer, they don't go away on their own. Uh, and then they can sometimes present as growths or little lumps uh, with a kind of indentation in the middle, and I'll have some pictures to show in the next uh, slide. Uh, and then very often they kind of present as open source. So one of the common um, stories that we hear is that, oh, I thought I nicked myself uh, when I was shaving, you know, but then that little cut just never went away after six weeks or, you know, so if it's a little cut that you think or like a little acne scar, you know, but it, they, things should really heal w within four to six weeks. And if they're still there, you know, that's usually a sign that maybe we should take a closer look. Uh, and then certainly for melanoma, changing brown and irregular spots or if your moles are changing, uh, that's another thing to uh, consider. And just the fact that some spots are different from others is another sign that we'll cover and talk about some more. But these are just some very rough guidelines in terms of things to watch out for in terms of signs of skin cancer. And so for basal cell, it's the most common type of skin cancer that we see. Uh, it is definitely associated with sun exposure and usually presents as a non-healing bump. So uh, very common uh, on the face uh, and sun exposed areas. You can kind of appreciate a little bump here, uh, but in some sometimes it can be kind of scalier and flatter. And in most individuals, uh, they grow locally, but they don't spread or they don't metastasize. Uh, and so these are just some more pictures of uh, basal cell skin cancer. 
we use these are usually the ones we see in clinic you know so they're little bumps that are pearly uh, you can uh, appreciate that not all of them are pearly bumps you know they can present in multiple ways some can be uh, kind of indented like that uh, and again the head and neck and face area is a very common area that we see skin cancers present and then I just put this very dramatic case of a basal cell uh, skin cancer just to illustrate that it is still a skin cancer. So over time, if we don't take care of them, you know, they can grow. So, uh, and so this is just to illustrate that even though it's generally considered a skin cancer that's relatively local, it's still important to take care of them. Uh, and so when you uh, see a dermatologist and, you know, uh, we're suspicious of a potential skin cancer, what usually uh, involves, uh, what usually is necessary for the diagnosis is a little tiny biopsy on that spot uh, that we see. Uh, and so generally the biopsy is actually a very small procedure we can do within five minutes, uh, five to 10 minutes, uh, depending on experience. And so there's a little bit of a uh, lidocaine injection to numb that area before we cut it off. Uh, and then after we cut it off, we send it to the lab to get a definitive diagnosis. Uh, and you will be left with a tiny scar at the biopsy site, uh, but then you will have a definite answer in terms of what that lesion is. And so when we diagnose a skin cancer, a basal cell skin cancer, uh, the goal of treatment generally is to make sure that there's no more skin cancer left. Uh, and so there are actually lots of different types of treatment for basal cell, and a lot of this depends on the type of basal cell and how deep the basal cell goes. Uh, but in So the first option, if it's just on the top layer of the skin, meaning just in the epidermis, that very top layer that provides our barrier function, there are times that we can just use a topical cream to treat it, uh, it to treat the basal cell. And that's usually really nice because you, you don't have to undergo any other further procedures. Uh, and the, it, But it is a little bit more cumbersome in terms of you would need to apply a cream every day for an extended period of time. And then some other options, depending on the depth and the location uh, of the basal cell skin cancer, are uh, something called blue light therapy. Uh, and then there's a, a procedure that we call scrape and burning, uh, where we essentially numb it again and then scrape and burn off the skin cancer. Uh, and then there's also the option of just cutting out the whole thing uh, entirely uh, with local surgery. And then finally, there's this category called Mo surgery. Uh, and that's generally reserved for skin cancers that are on sensitive areas, generally on the face, um, where you, we would want it to look as good as possible when we remove it. And so this is just a picture of what most surgery entails. Uh, and so, uh, like I said, it is usually used when skin cancer is on the face or on other sensitive skin sites. Uh, and so the goal is to remove the whole skin cancer, but take as little tissue as possible. And so when you undergo a Mohs procedure, you generally can actually expect to be in the office for three to four hours at least that day. Because what happens is your uh, uh, dermatologist or your skin surgeon will come in and you know they will take a very small piece initially uh, just to look at it under the microscope that same day. When they look at, at the microscope, they can see where there's still cancer remaining. Uh, so for example, if I look at it in terms of a clock face, 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock still has a little bit of skin cancer, but 3 o'clock to 11 o'clock are completely clear. Then in that case, we'll go back and just take a very tiny piece just from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock and then look at it under the microscope again. And so, you know, we repeat this process until the whole thing is removed, uh, but with taking as little tissue as possible to ensure the best cosmetic outcome. And so uh, this technique is really nice because it, you know, really also gives us a chance to make sure that same day that the skin cancer is gone. And so almost has one of the highest cure rates for, for skin cancer, but it's not always necessary. And so the second category of skin cancers that we commonly see is something called squamous cell carcinoma. 
And this is the second most common skin cancer that we see. Again, usually associated with sun exposure, uh, but in uh, certain patients with uh, human papillomavirus infections or immunosuppression, you know, they can be at higher risk for more aggressive squamous cell skin cancers. And in the, those cases, you know, sometimes these skin cancers can actually spread and cause significant uh, disease or sometimes even death. And so um, this is a clinical picture of the way a lot of skin cancer, uh, squamous cell skin cancers present to us. Uh, very often a scaly red patch here, you know, that feels a little substantive uh, or sometimes uh, even like an ulcer type of um, a lesion can also be a squamous cell skin cancer. Very common, we also see like a little horn, like a we call this a cutaneous horn, actually, because it's the, the name kind of speaks for itself. Uh, and then, or like red bumps, you know, on uh, commonly sun-exposed areas. And so, uh, again, the diagnosis for uh, squamous cell skin cancer involves a biopsy, which I will not repeat uh, in terms of what uh, it entails, but it's essentially the same procedure as a basal cell. Uh, and then most of the time, uh, the treatment re requires some type of surgery again. So either the local excision or Mohs, but if it's very superficial, once again, we can actually treat it with a topical cream or scraping and burning. So depending on the depth of the skin cancer, you know, we actually do have a lot of different, lot of different options in terms of treatment. And so just key points for the first part, you know, bumps and growth that bleed on its own and don't fully heal uh, should be checked by a dermatologist. And usually the diagnosis involves a small biopsy that can leave a scar. The treatment depends on the type and the depth of the skin cancer, but can uh, be very uh, simple from a cream to something more extensive like surgery. And so this is a picture of uh, one of our retreats at uh, UCI Dermatology. Uh, this concludes my part of the talk, and I'm going to introduce, uh, let Dr. Smith talk about melanoma and basic prevention strategies. That was great. Thank you so much. Uh, hard act to follow. You can't get the lights down or anything, can you? Yeah, I think people can't see terribly well. Yeah, it's those big lights. Oh, there we go. Yay. Wonderful. So I'm going to talk about melanoma. It is the least common uh, skin cancer, but it's the most deadly. Mm, not there. Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. All right. Not my lecture. OK. Um, all right. Well, I'll just whatever. <laughs> That's OK. So. Uh, what I was going to show you is a picture here which shows you the five most common cancers uh, in... Okay, just again. Yay, good. <laughs> uh, rewind, rewind, rewind. Uh, all right, so here we go. So on this side, uh, this is the five most common cancers in a woman. This is the five most common cancers in a man. Breast and lung for women, prostate and lung for men, but number five on both of those lists is melanoma. So in 2023, there will be 186,680 new cases of melanoma diagnosed. 89,000 of them will be in situ. In situ means that the uh, melanoma is still in that first layer of skin, the epidermis that she showed you, still in there. That's where we wanna make the diagnosis because there are no blood vessels, no lymph channels, no way for it to go anywhere else in the body. Unfortunately, we also have 97,610 invasive melanomas with a little skew towards the men and 7,990 deaths, again, skewed towards the men. So is there any good news about melanoma? Well, about 20 years ago when I was practicing, uh, we didn't have much for melanoma. So if somebody's melanoma escaped and went to their lymph nodes and that sort of thing, we had a few drugs, but they didn't work very well and they were brutal. But in 
2012, no, 2011, uh, we, the FDA approved two new drugs, and they're amazing. They're amazing. They're not perfect, but they're amazing, and it has turned around the whole um, treatment of melanoma. So one of them is a targeted therapy. That means it's targeted towards melanoma specifically, and it goes after it. And the other is an immunotherapy. Immunotherapy stimulates your immune system to go after that melanoma. So oftentimes, we'll do a combination of things. So if you look at the numbers for death due to melanoma from 1986 to 2013, we had an increase of 7.5%. But now look at 2013 to 2016, we actually went down by about 18%. So amazing new drugs. So melanoma is most often in Caucasians. But there is a group of others who, you know, Hispanics, American Indians, Asian Pacific Islanders, who also develop melanomas and often get forgotten because they, because um, we always talk about Caucasians having melanomas. But particularly this group here, the Hispanics, the, they are, have, they have the, fa I can never get this right, they have the fastest increase in new melanomas of any group. So we really want to target those Hispanic patients and make sure that we're taking good care of them. African Americans, they don't get as many melanomas as we do, but they have four times more likely to receive a diagnosis of melanoma after the cancer has progressed, so after it's metastasized. So if you look at their five-year survival, that is how many people are still alive in five years, they are way behind. So again, another group that we're looking at. So how does your gender affect melanoma? So until 49, women have a higher risk for developing melanoma than men. After 50, men are more likely to develop melanoma than women. The incidence of melanoma. So melanoma has for years gone up and up and up and up. And then about, about five years ago, we started to level off and now we've come down a little bit. So we're very happy about that. Death rate, again, was going up slightly and lately is now coming down. So very excited about that. So there's some nuances to, the, um, to who, who gets them and at what age and that sort of thing. So if you're younger than 50, the incidence of melanoma has stabilized in women and decreased by 1% in men. So that's fabulous. Uh, older than 50, the incidence of melanoma has stabilized in men but increased 1% in women. So another group that we're trying to target now. So if you think about five-year survival, how many patients are, are still alive in five years, the uh, number right now is 93.5%. In the 1950s, it was in the 50th percentile. So we've really, really come a long way with that. Um, so if you see there, I've got 100 people over here, and if 93.5 uh, uh, of them will still be alive in five years. Sorry, I'm having a hard time because some of the slides aren't here, but I'm getting there. Anyway, so where in the world, where in the world do we see melanoma? Well, the most common place is in New Zealand. And if you make a scale of one to 10 and you make New Zealand 10, this is the per capita uh, number of people who, who develop melanomas. So in the US, we're only 4.62, but we have the largest population. So 72,000 melanomas when this stops study was done. So how do we decide who we watch carefully and who's going to get a melanoma? Well, there's two types of risk factors. There's host risk factors and environmental. Host means the person. So what is it about this lady right here uh, that makes her apt to get a melanoma? So host factors include skin type. We talked about that already. So the lighter your skin, the more apt you are to have a melanoma. Age. Across the world, the age, uh, as, you're, as you age, you have more of a risk of developing melanoma. Um, in the United States, we've actually dipped that down a little bit, so, so that's actually a good thing. Gender, men get more melanomas than ladies. Per, uh, number of moles, if somebody has 100 or more moles, their chance of getting melanoma is increased. Personal history of the basal cells or squamous cells that Dr. Shu talked about. If you have those, you have an increased risk of melanoma. If you have a personal history of melanoma, your chances of getting another one are increased. Or if you have somebody in the family that's having melanoma, that's also true. Immunosuppression. So if you're a transplant patient or you have HIV or you're on chemo or you're on something for your rheumatoid arthritis, that increases your risk for melanoma. So here's a guy. He's going to be at increased risk for melanoma, right? He's pale. He freckles a lot. 
somebody with lots of moles, those basals and squamous cells, and then again, if you've had a melanoma before. Environmental risk factors. Well, the number one thing is ultraviolet radiation, and most of it that we get is from sunshine, but we're gonna talk a lot about tanning beds today. We do not like tanning beds. There's some information out there that air pollution can cause some trouble as well, so obviously Southern California could be in trouble that way as well, uh, but that is uh, to be worked out. So. Ultraviolet light, a risk factor for all types of skin cancers, the ones Dr. Shu talked about, the ones I talk about. One blistering burn during childhood can almost double the rate of skin cancer. More than five blistering burns before the age of 20 can increase melanoma risk by 80%, basal cell and squamous cell risk by 69%. So if you've got grandkids out there or kids and they're getting burnt over and over again, that's a bad thing. So tanning beds. So a lot of the kids are going out and getting tans in these tanning beds, but there is no safe tan. Doesn't matter whether it's indoors or outdoors, there's no safe tan, and tanning beds emit up to 12 times as much UVA than the sun, so that's not a good thing. Um, one of my girlfriends did this study, and I just thought this sentence was pretty amazing. She said, we show that the number of skin cancer cases due to indoor tanning is higher than the number of lung cancer cases due to smoking, so that's amazing. Terrible, terrible. Um, so, more hours in a tanning bed, higher risk of melanoma. So zero hours low, 50 plus hours high. And I see a lot of people who've had 50 plus hours. Um, the risk is highest for those exposed at a young age. So if you've got a 12 year old that's getting a tan or a 16 year old that's getting a tan, that's not a good thing. One in five adolescents and 59% of college students have been exposed to tanning beds. So it's a lot. So um, this group, AIM at Melanoma, likes to advertise this way, but the, even one indoor tanning session can increase users' risk of developing melanoma by 20%. Women younger than 30 are six times more likely to develop melanoma if they tan indoors. The International Agency on, Reser uh, on Research in Cancer um, classifies carcinogens in four groups. The worst group is number one, and that's how they classify tanning beds. What else is in that classification, that number one classification? Plutonium and cigarettes, all right? So that's how bad it is. So here we go, plutonium, cigarettes, tanning beds. Boom, all right, so this is what we don't want. Uh, and couple that with our Southern California li lifestyle with lots of sun and that sort of thing, that's a really bad combination. So how do you decide if you have a melanoma or not? Well, about 30 years ago, Dr. Um, Daryl Regal and Alfred Kopf at NYU said, let's make something to kind of teach people. And so they made the ABCDs. They didn't have E's, e's at that time, but we'll get to that. So what is A? A is asymmetry. So you ought to be able to take a mole, cut it down the middle, fold it in half. Well, not really, but you know what I mean, <laughs> in your mind. Uh, and it should match on both sides, okay? Otherwise, it's asymmetric. Uh, the border, if it's uneven, scalloped, jagged, or notched, that's a negative sign. Color, a mole with more than one color needs to be looked at. Now having said that, some people have a pale brown and a dark brown in the same mole, and that's usually not a problem. Uh, but if it's changing, that's a problem. Diameter, the mole is usually a larger than a pencil eraser. Now they say usually, we sometimes see some tiny ones, but most of them are uh, more than a fourth of an inch, more than six millimeters. Now my favorite is the evolution, and that got added a little bit later, but that's what Dr. Shu was talking about. If things change, if, if you have something and it was this big, and then two months later it's that big, that's something that somebody needs to see. Other changes that we look for are changes in color, changes in texture over the top, uh, bleeding, things like that. So some people say, well, these are kind of complicated to remember and everything like that. So they say, we just like to tell people about the ugly duckling sign. So if you have 50 things on your body and they all look the same and one looks different, then that's the ugly duckling and you need to take it to the dermatologist and get it looked at. Um, so where do we see melanomas? So um, in females, which are the pink here and men are the blue, females is most common on the limbs, most common lower limb, but also on the arms. In men, the most common spot is uh, the trunk, um, most often the back, but we see them on the, on the belly as well. Um, so how do we classify them? So the most common type of skin cancer is the superficial spreading. Uh, one, and it sort of speaks for itself. It starts in one place and it superficially spreads out. 
The second most common is, well, that's not true actually, maybe it's the third most common, nodular. So that sort of thing doesn't spread out. It actually starts and goes down into the deeper tissues quickly, and that can be very deadly. Lentigo malignant melanoma, this is probably the second most common, uh, we see in elderly patients, um, and it is a very slow-growing tumor. Uh, in fact, when I was Dr. Shu's age, we actually didn't even do anything about it. We just watched them. And if they started to do something ugly, then we took them off. So we have changed our feelings about that because some people metastasize before we really realize it. So we do take them off now. And then last but not least are the acral antigenous. Acral means hands and feet. So these are ones that occur there, and they can be a little bit more aggressive than some of the others. So again, here's that superficial spreading, starts here and moves out. But you can see this very asymmetric border here, some different colors in there, and that is a superficial spreading. Here's another one, it's different colors here and there. It has an area of what we call regression here, where the body decided to chew up part of it. That's always a bad sign. You don't want your immune system to notice. Um, and this is funny because you had this one in yours as a mole, but on mine it said it was a melanoma. So, But I put it in here for a reason, and that is that if you get that textural change, so you have 50 moles and only one of them gets that textural change, somebody should take a look at that. Um, this is a nodular melanoma, um, and it's very pigmented. Sometimes you can see a little pigment out the side. Some nodular melanomas have at least a portion that are amelanotic. What that means is there's no pigment there. When your skin doesn't have pigment, it's not white, it's pink. So if you have a pink one, uh, that is what we refer to as amelanotic. Uh, here's another one, it's a bit of a combo of the two. Um, Lentigo malignant melanoma, again, these are the ones we see in the elderly patients, and they're very slow growing, but we do like to catch these early now and try to get them off. There's another one, and this is an unfortunate spot. This was a tough surgery. Uh, acrolentigenous, so it doesn't have to be on the bottom of the foot. This one's on the side of the foot, but is under the microscope and acrolentigenous. Um, here's one on the bottom of the foot. You know, people, I mean, think about it. When's the last time you picked up and your foot and looked at the bottom? Probably not very often, and in fact, if you have somebody, an elderly parent at home or something like that, I want you all to go home and look at the bottom of their feet. Ah, good question. Smart woman up here. So how did they get sun there, she says. Well, there's some melanomas we don't think are caused by the sun, and that is probably one of them. So if you look at what we call the genetic signature of the melanoma, uh, it's kind of different than the genetic signatures that we see of ones that are sun exposed. So good question. Uh, and here's another one. This is a patient of mine who unfortunately lost most of his foot. So um, another acral type of melanoma is one where it starts in the matrix. Matrix is the word for mother, so that's where the nail is born, back here. And so you get a melanoma here, and it causes a streak out in the nail. So any kind of streak in the nail, not always melanoma, so don't freak out, um, but it should be looked at. Uh, when we look at them, what we see is sometimes a little pigment that comes back onto the skin here or up onto the tip of the toe. So not a good one. They can be very destructive of the nails. Um, I happen to be an oral disease doctor too, so I just threw this one in. But you can get them in the mouth, so I hope you're all getting um, uh, uh, dental uh, uh, exams. Yes. So, um, so if you have something you think it's weird, you could show, go see a dermatologist. I hope your dermatologist gives you a gown, but <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with this one. There you go. <laughs> anyway, um, and hopefully your, uh, your dermatologist actually has a dermatoscope as well. This is what we use to actually um, magnify the spot because it can show us some changes that we might not see otherwise with the naked eye. In fact, what do we see? Well, this is one melanoma we saw under the microscope and lots of little uh, globules, kind of pink here, brown there. Um, it has dilated blood vessels, and these are called pseudopods down there. So there are different things that we look for to decide if it's a melanoma. So you've got your mole, it's changing, you go in, they do a biopsy, and then they tell you, and this is the most important thing, how deeply does it go in the skin? So remember with Dr. Shu, she's telling you that in the second layer of skin, we got lots of blood vessels and, and lymph channels and that sort of thing. That's where you don't want it to be. So again, this is the in situ guy. He's completely in the first layer of skin, can't go anywhere else in the body. And we know now that the deeper it goes, 
down, the more apt it is to travel elsewhere. So if they think you've got something, you'll probably, actually, if they, if they make the diagnosis of melanoma, they're probably gonna go back, take a little extra skin, and you're gonna have kind of a big scar. But if it's a melanoma, that's what we wanna do. If there are certain characteristics we see to it, or if it's above a certain um, depth, uh, you also might have your lymph nodes checked, but that's a whole nother lecture, so we won't go there. All right, so how do we prevent it? Sun protection, sunscreens, protective clothing, sun avoidance. So there are two types of sunscreens. There are chemical sunscreens and physical blocks. Some people refer to them as organic and inorganic. So how do they do it? So physical blocks are exactly what they sound like. So you, the sun comes down and it bounces back. So that's kind of what you want. Chemical sunscreens actually absorb very superficially um, the sun and change the sort of uh, configuration of it and that sort of thing and, and makes it less worrisome. So when you go to the store, how do you pick your sunscreen? So um, all sunscreens now, this is a label that every, all of them have to have, should have an SPF, which is the sun protection factor, and I would want it to be at least 30. So some of the people, like the guys at NYU say, we want the highest number out there. And they have a point, because if you look at studies and you see how much sunscreen people put on, it's never enough. So the higher the number you put on, the more chance you are to actually have a 30 uh, SPF. Broad spectrum, it means it needs to cover ultraviolet A and ultraviolet B, and again, this now should be on the bottle. Water resistant, they're no longer allowed to say it's waterproof, uh, because none of them are waterproof, but they can be resistant, and some of them are 40 minutes, and some are 80 minutes, and again, supposed to be on the bottle these days. So here's a lady, after my own heart, wearing a zinc-based and whatever. Fortunately, nowadays we have micronized zinc, so it is, doesn't look this bad, um, but I think it's kind of cool. Um, I want you to go home and we have your kids and that sort of thing. I want you to say to them, oh wow, you look fantastic in those sunshades. Those are fantastic. And that rash guard, oh wow, I bet the kids down the road don't have a, as cool a one as that. They need to know that this is the way to be. Uh, I have to tell you, I mean, having, I have five kids, and when they got to be about 16-ish, they wouldn't wear them anymore. But if you can keep them from zero to 16 in these things, it's a real plus. Um, hats, there is a study out there that looked at the size of the brim, and for each inch of the brim that you increase, you increase your sun protection by 10%. So here's a lady with a nice hat, Here's a lady with a really nice hat, right? Yeah, a little hot, I think, though. Uh, and then Dr. Smith always likes to cover that neck, and especially in guys. Guys never remember to put their sunscreen on their neck. This is my dog showing off his shades. Yep, yep, he's cool. Uh, and then sun avoidance. Um, so you limit your exposure to the sun between 10 and 4. You seek shade. So if you're watching your kid play soccer and there's a tree, you go sit under the tree. You be the poster mom for that. Um, Reverse schedule. What that means is if you're used to going to movies at night and walking on the beach during the day, flip it, right? Go to movies during the day and walk on the beach at night. Avoid tanning booths. I think we've probably hammered that one in. So if you follow all those things, you can be as pale as my children, <laughs> and that would be a good thing. UCI. UCI. I'm supposed to say that a number of times. UCI. So I think we'll take questions now. Yay. I will come out into the audience with the okay. microphone. Thank you so much. I have a question related to follow-up. A friend of mine got a melanoma on their ear nine and a half years ago. They had it removed. They thought everything was fine. This year they were diagnosed with liver and spine cancer, and the origin was melanoma. So you know, there was really, went to dermatology for checks, external, but there was really no, there, you know, I'm asking the question, how do no, you follow up question. for that? Very good question. So there's no standard across the country, so everybody has their own little thing, but we never say never for melanoma. I had a patient who had a melanoma come back 35 years later. So, so it is something which you have to follow up forever. I think some people out there kind of say, okay, it's been five years, you're fine. 
but you found out from your friend that that's not the case. So I wash my patients. Um, if it's really deep, I might even see them every three months for a while, and then I'll do six months, and then I'll do a year. If it's really thin, I usually do six months for two years, and then yearly after that, but I do it forever. But how about the follow-up when it's gone from your ears? Ah. Well, if you've had a melanoma, I'm going to be feeling your notes. Uh, I'm going to be asking you questions, you know, do you have headaches that just won't go away? Do you have visual symptoms? Um, are you coughing up any blood? Are you, you know, so you're asking questions. But you're absolutely right, it can sneak up on you, no symptoms at all, so it is tough. Well, actually, my question was very similar to it. And how do you know that they got it all? I always feel like... Uh, did they really, oh, and then uh, uh, let me uh, add another question. I have a lot of squamous cells. Does that automatically mean, and I had a melanoma, s small, really early, and so on. Do they kind of go inside? You mean or they go together? Do they go, no, do like, they go inside? Oh, inside? No, no, no. Do they come because you have squamous? You are more likely to get, okay. So the reason why when you have squamous or basal cell, you're more likely to get melanoma is what that basically says is that you're getting more sun. You probably had more sun damage and sun exposure. So we tend to see skin cancers do, they come together, you know, uh, a lot of times. And then in terms of checking, uh, removal, you know, it's never a hundred percent. We're limited by the ways we can check, right? So most of the time when we do surgery, we send it into the lab and we definitely check the margins to so that they're clear. But that's not a hundred percent. You know, it could be that there's one little tiny cell remaining that we just can't see under the microscope. So the blood test is usually for when it's spread. You know, there's no blood blood test for uh, regrowth in that same area, but definitely by our physical clinical exam, we check. You know, and there are other, you know, people are actually doing a lot of research in terms of whether we can predict whether things can come back. That's certainly just in the research phase now, but there are lots of people working on looking at the genetic signature or certain, you know, molecular things that perhaps we can follow over time that would be indicative. Uh, but right now, the current standard of care is just clinical monitoring. 20 years ago, we used to do lots of blood tests and lots of scanning, lots of imaging, we call it. But what we found in studies over time was we almost never found them. Uh, and often, I remember one patient we had probably 25 years ago who on a CT scan had a little spot on their, on their lung. So we opened them up and we went in and they had swallowed some food sometime way back when and, and we opened up their chest for no reason. So, so over the years we found that that doesn't help, that the best thing is to see the patient, feel their nodes, ask them questions and watch their other moles. Because the other thing you have to watch for is once somebody's had one melanoma, their chance of having another is increased. Question, for sunscreen, when are you supposed to apply it? So that's a good question because um, probably 20 years ago it was said all the time you have to put it on 20 minutes ahead and otherwise it doesn't work. Well, actually, I was just at a lecture uh, from a guy from NYU, and he said, guess what? We have now perfected it in a way where you don't have to do it that uh, early beforehand. I still tell people it's probably a good idea to put it on beforehand. I mean, because what you don't want is to get out there and 20 minutes after you get into the sun, you put it on, right? So, so I say, eh, put it on before you go out. Make sure those kids have it on for sure. And again, you probably tell from my thing, clothing. I am big on, on protective clothing. And also just uh, the amount that you apply. I think Dr. Smith mentioned most people don't apply enough sunscreen. So the, to get the SPF 30, for example, I think you're supposed to apply like a shot glass worth of uh, sunscreen for one leg. 
And nobody does that, so which is why we recommend a higher SPF, even though you've probably all seen numbers like, oh, 50 and 40, it's just a 95 to 92.5% difference, you know? But really, it's because we don't apply enough, so the difference is larger. I have a question for oh, you. Can I say one last thing? Um, then the one thing we sometimes see in clinic is people who use the spray, and they come in with stripes of whatever. So now people are saying, if you use the spray, do it twice. So hopefully you will not miss those little stripes. What do you really think is the difference between the uh, mineral-based sunscreens and the chemical-based ones? Since the majority of products are chemical, therefore they're cheaper to make. Mm -hmm. Some people say those chemicals, depending on which ones, are not as safe to put on your skin, especially repeatedly. The zinc oxide, et cetera, is uh, titanium oxide is much more expensive, but yeah, so again, depending who you read, they say that's better for you. What do you really think about it? So what I like to know. Dr. Dr. Smith, great question. Dr. Smith and I were just talking about that just because there's so much research coming out now. But there was a recent study uh, looking at blood levels, you know, blood levels of chemical sunscreen components and found that you can actually find them in your blood, you know. But we don't really know what it means, you know. But, you know, for me, we, we don't know what that means, but we know that the mineral zinc sunscreens do not do that, you know. So, for, you know, for my own children, I would do a mineral sunscreen. But we always say any sunscreen is better than no sunscreen. Yes. And Dr. Mezenkoska and I just did a study, and we looked, we actually pulled all the papers that said, okay, so it gets into your bloodstream, what happens then? And there really isn't a lot of research on it. So that was the conclusion of our paper was that we need to do more research and find out whether that's a problem. I mean, there were a few studies that didn't really find much. Um, so we're hopeful that that's what it's gonna be, but, um, but not a lot of good answers for that. And she's right, for my kids, I always used the physical blocks. Um, but, but I have to tell you, <laughs> They're harder to get on, you have to keep whenever. So you have a wiggly little child, sometimes it's just better to use a chemical screen because as she says, no sunscreen is worse than some, what did you say? <laughs> Something like that. Any sunscreen is better oh, yeah, than yeah, no sunscreen. <laughs> I, had, uh, I had two questions. Yeah. First one, um, when you examine a patient that comes in for uh, a suspicious mole or a uh, curious lesion that their primary care doctor is concerned about refers them to dermatology. Um, at what point, as a dermatologist, do you or do you just focus just on the issue that brought them in, or do you then open that up to, well, they're here, let's do a complete skin examination? What first question. And then, second question I saw a slide that talked about. Um, the five-year survival for melanoma at 93.5 percent. Can you quantify that by, are those patients surviving? Are they thriving? And also, I noticed that during your presentation, Dr. Smith, uh, you didn't talk about staging. And maybe I was late for a few minutes. Uh, I didn't catch it in the first presentation. That's but Okay, because uh, the issue of staging, I mean, seeing all those lesions of different kinds, um, well, cancer is staged to determine its severity. Is it like a topical cream type treatment, or at what point does the biopsy result come back and indicate this is serious, we need to move forward, because the stage of it is life-threatening? Thank you. Great question. So I'll take the first question regarding the skin exam, you know, how, uh, how off, you know, how extensive of a skin exam does everybody need, you know, and so I think a lot of times, um, and, and this is especially true for very busy practices that see a lot of patients, you know, they might not necessarily have all the time, you know, to do a full skin exam, but I would say for me personally, and I learned this from my mentor, Dr. Smith, uh, in general, you know, I always ask about any type of risk factors, you know, so any personal history of skin cancer obviously is, a, uh, to me, is an automatic full skin exam. Uh, family history of melanoma is also a full skin exam, you know, and then certainly if you were on certain medications or you were immunosuppressed, for example, that would put 
you're at higher risk, you know. That's also an indication for a full skin exam. That being said, you know, not every time, uh, you know, I have patients that come in for a yearly skin exam, and then sometimes in between, they'll send me a message or send me a picture and say, hey, do I need to worry about this? And in that case, usually we just take a look at that spot particularly, you know, so it kind of depends. Uh, but I also have patients that are, you know, will tell me, I would like a more, you know, extensive skin exam more frequently. And that's also, you know, it just kind of depends on the personal level of comfort. I always generally offer a full skin exam and a gown, but certainly I would say half of my patients are like, I don't need a full gown. I just want you to look at this. So it, it kind of depends. And I would just add to that, that, um, Guys never look at their back. So if a guy comes in and he wants me to look at that, I say before I go out, I go, would you mind if I look at your back? <laughs> I don't think anybody looks at your back. So I just pull up their shirt and look at their back and that's it. But, but oftentimes they've already told me, I don't want a full exam, but they usually let me look at their back. Anyway, so melanoma staging. So a little bit complicated, but just to say, when we do the biopsy, there's certain things we look for under the microscope. So one of them is that Breslow death, depth, and the reason I highlighted that one, because that's the one that's most indicative of how things are gonna turn out in the long run. But there are other things. So for example, ulceration, which means that the, the body has somehow managed to lose that top layer of skin somewhere within that melanoma. That's a bad sign. There's something called um, uh, intravascular invasion. Uh, so if, if some of the cells have actually gotten into a blood vessel and you can actually see that under the microscope, that's negative. So there are about 10 things that we look for. And on every um, pathology sheet now, they list them all. So it says this, no, this, yes, this, whatever, right? Um, there's another thing called mitotic rate. So the faster a melanoma is turning over, the more apt it is to metastasize and go other places. So if I have a high mitotic rate, I am, um, I'm watching that person a lot more closely, okay? Um, what else can I tell you? Um, so, so on every patient we do that. Um, there's something called sentinel lymph node biopsy, and what that is is um, if somebody has a certain depth, and there, we have sort of lines that we draw, and they, don't, and they have ulceration or this, whatever. So if there's certain parameters that they have, we will say to them, I want to check your lymph nodes. And I don't mean just feel them. We do a surgery. And what you do is, let's say they had the melanoma right here. You inject the area with two things. One is a radioactive tracer, and the other is a blue dye. And then you wait for a little while, and, and then you open them up up here, and there's something called the sentinel node. So you know the sentinel is the guy out in front of the castle, right, that guards everybody else. The sentinel node is the first lymph node it goes into. So what you do, and, and that first lymph node gets the blue. And that first lymph node, if you use a, whatever they call those things for radioactive, uh, uh, a Geiger counter. If the, guy, if the Geiger counter says this is the node, so you take that node out, you sew them back up, and then you go to the lab and you look. If they have melanoma in that node, it suggests that maybe things have gone a little further than you would like them to, and so then you're doing more for that patient as well. Okay, does that answer everything? Nope. Not, not really. Okay, the, sorry. The thing is, it was a great explanation, mm -hmm. but a little technical. Yeah, sorry. What I'm trying to determine, doctor, is, uh, is it a color thing? Is it the spread that you talked about? Is it the size of it? Is it the texture of it? At what point is, when you, I, I think something you said earlier, cancer is called early. You know, the earlier the better, that right, kind right. of thing. At what point would a stage one, two cancer be considered as being caught early and the treatment is a little bit more straightforward creams and so forth, then it's caught later. And usually if the indication is a small thing, either on the back, the ear, the neck, and so forth, right. then the testing, the amount of uh, uh, rigor that you talked about that would take place at that point, how then is it considered, okay, it's still this little thing, and yes, it's melanoma, but it's going to be staged higher because of the amount of extra work that you do, right. or is there something that says this is bad? Right. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so looking at the mole itself, it is true that sometimes we can go, oh, that's worse. So remember those nodular ones. So when we see a nodular one, we're like, uh, we don't like that. So we're more apt to do a little bit more for something like that. But it really does come down to what we see on that biopsy report. So if the biopsy report says you have a 0.3 millimeter melanoma, you go, yes.
because that's a very, very thin melanoma. And if you look at the statistics overall, the chances that it's going to metastasize go somewhere else in the body is very, very small. So does that help? Yeah. I'm just going to add to that by kind of showing it in this diagram, which is the Breslau level that Dr. Smith talked about, you know, and that essentially is how deep it goes when we don't do the biopsy. And we know, for example, when you look on the far left, the TIS and T1, in general, if it's just at that level, the survival rate is quite high, you know, but if we're talking about T4, then at the survival rate is much lower, you know. So yes, the 93.5% is a general statistic and we subcategorize them based on, you know, the staging, but in general, the staging is based on the depth and then some other components that Dr. Smith mentioned. I, I, uh, one of the dermatologists I visited um, pointed out that I had a splotch on my lips and he said that uh, lip cancer spreads more rapidly. Is that true? So the most common uh, cancer to see on the lip, and I mean the red part of the lip, is a squamous cell. Squamous cells, especially on the bottom lip, um, tend to metastasize faster than squamous cells anywhere else. Uh, and so, and, and there's some statistic out there, I think it's like 60% or something like that. They find when it, once you have it, they already have a node somewhere. So we're very, very anxious about those. We often, you know, uh, uh, do a big surgery and that sort of thing, make sure they're gone. One other thing I should say is if anybody has a burn scar, that's the other place where we see um, bad squamous cells. So people don't think about it. You know, they were two years old and their mom spilled their coffee on them and they have a big burn down their arm. If you get a sore and a burn scar, that needs to be seen right away. Also, increased risk of metastasis. Thank you. Uh, I'll come down over here. When you have a squamous cell surgery and they go in a certain depth, usually on the legs, it is a very slow healing rate. What do you think and how much success have you had with the wound healing application? That's one question. And the other question is, at what point do you see or how successful is it to do the creams if you feel something coming up? I mean, what is the... the because I've been using it and it didn't really work. Thank you. <laughs> so anything below the knee after the age of 35 does not heal well. Yeah, you still have time. <laughs> so <laughs> but, um, there are other things you can use. As you say, there are some creams. She talked about those creams. Usually we use the creams when they're in situ, again, in that first layer of skin. Once they go down, we gen generally do more surgery. Now, having said that, there is one other option. There's something called 5-fluorouracil. It's actually a chemo agent that some people use for other types of cancers inside their body. But we actually inject it into the area, and sometimes you can avoid doing surgery if you use the 5-FU. Okay, but what do you think about the wound healing? Very slow. No. Oh. Oh, like the last day session. Could you repeat your questions? Oh, okay, yeah. So she's asking about something that they put in the wound to help. It's wound healing at home. Okay. So, so there are some. I can't say that I've ever used them in a skin cancer case, but, you know, some people get leg ulcers for other reasons, for circulation reasons and that. And so sometimes we'll use something called an elastase, which goes in and kind of chews up some of the fiber that's getting in the way of healing and that sort of thing. So we do that. But... Uh, other than that, I, I don't usually use that for skin cancer. Um, I have to say, most people who've had skin cancer, although they heal slowly, they actually heal pretty well. But slowly, yeah. Too slow. Too slow. My question is in regards to sunscreen. So if we walk into a store, if we put the marketing filters on and take all that away, other than SPF and broad spectrum, what are, is there a, key ingredient or uh, organization with a stamp of approval or rating that we should look for? Or brands you recommend. <laughs> <laughs> we have to be careful with that. Yeah, I don't think we have any particular brands we would recommend, but I would say in general, you know, um, 
that a high SPF, you know, and then depending on your skin concern also, like, you know, we have certain patients that I recommend a tinted sunscreen for, for example, uh, but not for skin cancer prevention in general. Uh, but I think that the AD, I think has, a, like the American Academy of Dermatology actually has a list of sunscreens, you know, but there's no, there's no one particular brand we recommend. Yeah, and the website is aad.org under patient information. All right, this will be our last question. Uh, you've spoken a lot about surgery. What about radiation? Uh, good. Oh, good question, really good audience. Okay, so yes, we do use radiation. Um, interestingly, in Europe, they use it a lot more. Um, we don't use it as much here, and I'm gonna say something controversial, but it's probably because not that we have lobbies in medicine, but the surgeons are pretty like, yes, we want to do surgery, right? So, so we don't do it as much. Um, there was a time when there was a machine that did a very superficial type of radiation, maybe five to 10 years ago, uh, and it was very popular for a bit, and then the insurance companies stopped paying for it. Uh, so then that one went. Um, but radiation is great. Uh, my husband has to be, happens to be British, and uh, so in Britain, they do a lot of, of um, radiation often heals well, but I have to tell you, it's six weeks, you have to go in most days of the week, um, you can get radiation burns. Um, let's say it's somewhere like here. Sometimes you can get, it gets here, but then you get some radiation uh, mucositis, which is inflammation inside the mouth. Uh, I mean, they're better at it these days. When I was her age, um, the radiation guys, they just blasted you with it, and so you got lots of side effects. They're much better at it these days, and so I think it is a good option, yeah. All right, well, thank you so much, Dr. Shu and Dr. Smith. Thank you all for coming, and uh, we will resume this series on September 25th, so we look forward to having you back next year. Thank you.